morning. morning. It is our great pleasure this morning to benefit from the gifts of Betsy Lay, who is um, the assistant to the academic dean. That's not your right title. It's your right <laughs> Which makes it sound like she actually does the amount of work she does because she keeps me organized. So thank you, Betsy. Thank you also to the students in the Unitarian Universalist community here in Iowa who have planned our worship and will lead us in it this morning. It is so appropriate for UEA folks to be leading and ministering and serving in the Lord in Iowa because of the radical justice movements that the Great Awakening community seeks to be involved in the world. And so I'm glad that we have um, a service in that tradition today and a service tomorrow that Rabbi Hilly is preaching for us. Um, it will be in a different style. Um, so, help us into In the words of Amy Mackenzie Flynn, welcome to this common, sacred space. Common because we all are welcome. Sacred because here we transform the ordinary and attend to the profound. We carry with us our regrets, our doubts, fears, stories, laughter. May they inspire our worship. Above all, may we each make what we need most to find on this day in this common, sacred space. I feel that when we're on the way in, that two gray and steel pistols and steel number 223. Actually, that's around. So, we have a little thing we're going to do. Um, so, we're going to need you guys to participate. Uh, we'll, I'll take you at once so we all have some outlets. And then, uh, just have sort of your continue on and then bring a session for them. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. 
cannot stop the injustice does not exempt you from acting in what you sincerely and reflectively hold to be the best interest of your community. Where there is power, there is resistance. We must learn the capacity to accept an unjust system is to cooperate with that system and thereby to become a participant in its evil. After all, if you do not resist the apparently inevitable, you will never know how inevitable the inevitable was. It is not our differences that divide us. It is our inability to recognize, accept, and celebrate those differences. Paralyze resistance with persistence. I am more convinced than ever before that the method of nonviolent resistance is the most potent weapon available to oppress people in their struggle for justice and human dignity. I refuse to accept the view that mankind is so tragically bound to the starless midnight of racism and war that the bright daybreak of peace and brotherhood can never become a reality. I believe that unarmed truth and unconditional love will have the final word. Do not be daunted by the enormity of the world's grief. Do justly now. Love mercy now. Walk humbly now. You are not obligated to complete the work, but neither. Are you free to again? The function of freedom is to free someone else. Without community, there is no liberation. Please join me in a spirit of meditation. <coughs> In a world so filled with brokenness and sorrow, 
It would be easy to lose ourselves in never-ending grief, to be choked by our outrage, to be paralyzed by the enormity of suffering, to feel our hearts squeeze tight to hopelessness. Instead, this morning, let us simply breathe together as we hold our hearts. transforming power of love, breathing out as we pray for peace in our own world and in our lives. Breathing in as we hold hope in our hearts, breathing out as we pray for justice in our world and in our lives. May we know our strength our love flow from us into the world. Breathing in, we are the prayer. Breathing out, we are the healing. Breathing in, we are the love. Breathing out, are the peace. Breathing in, we are the hope. Breathing out, we are the justice. May we know our strength. May we be filled with courage. May our love join together and focus our energy in the spirit of prayer. Our prayers reach out to the larger world. Our thoughts are with the families of Clint, Michigan, who over the past year have been drinking poisoned water, and whose children are now faced with lives impacted by lead poisoning. This situation represents an egregious failure on the part of the state and local government to protect the health of the poor and mostly minority citizens of that community. Our thoughts are also and always with the thousands and thousands of refugee families who are willing to take unimaginable risks for a better life and to secure the safety and well-being of their children. May we citizens of the world Show them compassion and kindness on their journey. Our prayers reach out to the island community. Our thoughts and prayers for the Reverend Dr. Bill Coons of Islet's Office of Professional Formation Team, who had open heart surgery on Monday morning. We pray for his health and we wish him a speedy recovery. <clears throat> We're grateful for the work of all in our community. Grateful for Ryan Duncan and Reverend Dr. Kathy Kelsey for facilitating these Wednesday services. Grateful for Betsy Lay <coughs> for sharing her musical talents. Grateful for the faculty and staff at Iowa who enrich, support, challenge, and provoke our hearts and souls. 
and grateful for our colleagues and classmates who journey with us. As we hold open this space of prayer and positive energy, I invite you to speak into the room the names of friends, loved ones, acquaintances, and even adversaries who are weighing you on our hearts and our minds and who need the blessings of this community. <clears throat> Deborah Stewart. celebration with the sorrows and concerns spoken here may you feel our sympathy and compassion for all that remains unspoken both joy and sorrow may the caring of our community offer you both kindness and hope let's join our hearts and minds and spirits in meditation for a moment to talk with you about the path of least resistance as part of the theology of resistance, especially in the context of my community. Yes, it's important to resist the forces of racism, homophobia, environmental destruction, colonialism, and violence. These evils and others separate us from our humanity, from our source, and from our sense of interdependent connectedness to all life and the planet. Even if theology doesn't push us in this direction, simply simple common sense requires us to resist. How can we survive and flourish into our best selves when all these horrors take up airspace, control, and constrain what we do and how we do it? Sometimes we resist by speaking up and speaking out. <coughs> We attend legislative hearings, we vote, we work to get the vote out, we march. Sometimes we resist with direct service. We volunteer at hospice, we serve meals at the soup kitchen, we tutor people at the homeless shelter about building a resume. We try to meet evil or the effects of evil, where it is, in big ways and in small. But what about those times when we take the path of least resistance? What about the times when we let a sexist comment slide on by? Or when we choose not to speak up or not to help? What is that all about? We make those choices for a reason. Maybe we don't want to call attention to ourselves. We don't want to do something embarrassing. We want to be nice. And sometimes the path of least resistance can be positive. I read a blog post recently where the author said that when we follow our hearts, we follow a path of least resistance that helps us enjoy and really flourish in what we do. This is what that guy with an unpronounceable name wrote about in his book called Flow. You might have guys familiar with that book. His name is actually Mihai Chik Sent Mihai, but it's spelled with all uh, syllables and no vowels. But the path of least resistance can also be our witting or our unwitting contribution to the status quo. One more brick in the wall that separates us. 
The status quo, after all, is made up of the norms we live under. And the norms are the product of the dominant culture. And the dominant culture is based on a history of enslavement, oppression, and colonialism. In Iowa's identity, power, and difference class, and I see several of my classmates here, we learn to confront some of the difficult truths about privilege and power. Alan Johnson writes in Privilege, Power, and Difference that the odds are loaded for a path of least resistance, sometimes because it's the only path we see, sometimes because it's the easiest and safest path to take. Psychologists know that when we think about anything, we follow a path of least resistance. Without even thinking, we immediately and automatically categorize each situation based on previous experience. Think about that. Is your previous experience something that you want to replicate? I know mine is. I grew up in a suburb of Detroit in the 1950s and 60s, which was determinedly white. I say determinedly because my suburb, called Gross Point, had the dubious distinction of creating the point system. The point system assigned points to people based on the darkness of their skin, the thickness of their accent, among other things. Too many points, and the real estate people by agreement would not show any houses for sale. The system was, of course, declared illegal in the 1960s, but its existence had a profound effect on the world I grew up in and on the experiences that got fed into the database of my brain. I didn't know anything about the point system until much later. Actually, I learned about it in a sociology class in college where they talked about my suburb and the point system as being horrible examples of institutionalized racism. It was shocking to me and embarrassing. I don't feel responsible for the point system, but I do feel responsible for the sense of reality and the basic assumptions about life that it helped to engender. In the world I grew up in, African American people worked for white people and not the other way around. African American people lived apart from white people. Only men went to work. Everyone was heterosexual, local, and cisgender. If I let my previous experience determine my current thinking, I would follow a path of least resistance that would keep those images alive and well as just the way things are, or even as images of a good and normal life. Luckily, I got out of my hometown and learned to experience people, places, and things far different from my constricted little world. I learned that my point of view was just that, my point of view. But I find that the process of digging deeper into the assumptions that got built into my brain, that process is a lifelong one. It requires vigilance and attention. I keep realizing over and over that there are more rocks to turn over, more assumptions to explore, that if I allow the path of least resistance to prevail, I'll keep thinking of the same wrong old Conversations with my professors and my classmates here are some of the best things happening to me in Iowa. I keep hearing ideas that I hadn't thought of, grappling with concepts that are unknown. I even <laughs> had to go get a Twitter account. <laughs> but, uh, learning language and seeing connections that are new. Every encounter with this community leaves me revitalized. I think of it as exfoliating my brain. <laughs> so the thought I wanted to share with you in this season of resistance and in this sacred space is to remain vigilant against the, against the quiet forces of evil, the status quo, our role in perpetuating wrongness, not because we're bad or because we have bad intentions, but just because we take that easy, comfortable, and comforting path of least resistance. As the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King said, we must learn that to passively accept an unjust system 
is to cooperate with that system and thereby to become a participant in the future. Now that he is safely dead, let us praise him. Build monuments to his glory, sing hosannas to his name. Dead men make such convenient heroes. They cannot rise to challenge the images we would fashion from their lives. And besides, it is easier to build monuments than to make a better world. This tragic and beautiful poem by Carl Wilhelm Hines serves 
as a jarring reminder of what Martin Luther King Jr. Day is about. Yes, the man, of course the man. But as important as he is, this holiday is not a day of celebration. It's not for us to look at our accomplishments and say, well done, I'm glad we fixed that. We pat ourselves on the back for the progress we've made. No. This holiday is an important reminder that our work is not done. It's a reminder to look at our society, at our culture critically, and remember that Martin Luther King Jr.'s dream is still unrealized. It's a day to renew our commitment to the work of this passionate, radical man. On Martin Luther King Jr. Day, we honor the work and the legacy of Dr. King, not by eulogizing him, but by taking up the baton and carrying it forward by continuing the work that he started. Now, I'll return to Dr. King in a moment. But first, a word about theologies. Our theologies matter. They're not just a collection of beliefs about God. They're not a passive accumulation of ideas about ultimate truth that we bring out when the conversation heads in the direction of spirituality, religion, and morality. Our theologies are not doctrines, they're not dogmas, they're not affirmations that we pull out and bring to church with us on Sundays. Rather, our theologies, each of our own individual, personal theologies, is a part of our own individual, personal identities. Specifically, how we understand who we are in relation to the divine or the universe, the cosmic order, the Tao, the great transcendent mystery, or whatever language you choose to express that for which ultimately there are no words. Now, I'm having a real theological my faith tradition, Unitarian Universalism, teaches, and I believe it, that we all, by virtue of our shared humanity, have inherent worth and dignity. My theology is one of original blessing, not original sin, that we're born good and whole. And yet, evil exists, and it's of our own making. Corrupt systems exist, human-made systems that perpetuate the marginalization and oppression of some for the benefit of others. These are social constructs, and we are the constructors. Nelson Mandela said, no one is born hating another person because of the color of his skin, or his background, or his religion, People must learn to hate. And if they can learn to hate, they can be taught to love. For love comes more naturally to the human heart than its opposite. And yet, we have invented, learned, and taught hate. Evil is alive and well. How did this happen? But more importantly, how do we resist it? Theologies of resistance rise in response to evil in its myriad forms. Micah 6 8 tells us that we are to act justly and to love mercy and to walk humbly with our God. Guided by our inner sense that drives us to seek justice, we are called to resist evil. I think this speaks to the complicated nature of our humanity. We are neither entirely good nor bad. We're constantly making bad decisions with the purest of intentions, and also of doing the right thing for the wrong 
zombies. That's all it's was fine saying. We're all walking that line as imperfect beings. Evil is not embodied in a single entity. The potential for evil lies in every one of us, as does the potential for good. Guided by our ideologies of resistance, we can choose to live into our potential for good by resisting evil. Now, in looking at theologies of resistance, I've noticed a few common ingredients among them uh, makes this process easier. Theologies of resistance include a commitment to justice. And justice means correcting the power imbalances of privilege and oppression. It means bringing the marginalized in from the margins and dethroning those wielders of power who place themselves at the center. Justice is when power is equally accessible to all. Justice is when we have power with rather than power over. Bell Hooks said, I want there to be a place in the world where people can engage in one another's differences in a way that is redemptive, full of hope and possibility. Not this, in order to love you, I must make you into something else. That's what domination is about. That in order to be close to you, I must possess you, remake and recast you. We resist evil, systemic, oppressive evil, when we resist injustice. I want there to be a place in the world where people can engage in one another's differences in a way that is redemptive, full of hope and possibility. Bell Hooks wants a world of hope and possibility. As do I. I think this is more than just wishful thinking. I think she believes that it's truly possible. As do I. In words like hope and possibility, I hear optimism. And this optimism is the next ingredient among theologies of resistance. Saul Alinsky, who recognized that we cannot always count on humans to do the right things for the right reasons, nonetheless held an optimistic perspective. To quote him, he said, A word about my personal philosophy. It is anchored in optimism. It must be. For optimism brings with it hope, a future with purpose, and therefore a will to fight for a better world. Without this optimism, there is no reason to carry on. Martin Luther King Jr. also held an inherent optimism. In the words of Dr. King, I refuse to accept the view that mankind is so tragically bound to the starless midnight of racism and war that the bright daybreak of peace and brotherhood can never become a reality. I believe that unarmed truth and unconditional love will have the final word. As I marched in the MLK parade on Monday, I joined in many of the chants that rose up from out of the crowd. At one point, someone called out, This is what democracy looks like. And we, the crowd, echo back, this is what democracy looks like. After a few repetitions, the phrase was rolling comfortably off my tongue, my voice finding strength and safety among the voices of the women and the men and the children around me. As I chanted, though, I found that more than an exercise of democracy, I was feeling the presence of community. This is what community looks like, was the chance in my head. And there I was, between the Iowa banner and several banners from a number of Unitarian Universalist congregations. As I looked around at the faces in the crowd, I saw friends and I saw strangers. 
And I thought, this is what community looks like. In that place, in that moment, I felt safe. I felt like I belonged. And I felt the divine presence, the spirit of life. This is what community looks like. And this community is an essential element in creating theology's resistance. Unitarian Universalist minister Wayne Armisen said, Take courage, friends. The way is often hard, the path is never clear, and the stakes are very high. Take courage. For deep down there is another truth. You are not alone. How do we resist evil? Orient yourself towards justice. Carry an inherent optimism. Embrace the power of community. We resist evil by building theologies of resistance. And we resist evil by choosing love. May it be so. Thank you. 
these words. To those who came here seeking the holy, may the holy go with you and with you. To those who came here seeking to embrace life, may life return to your affection. To those who came here seeking a better way, may you find that way and the patience and courage to take it step by step those who came here seeking a better world, may we make it so by the loving work of 